Thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. This is Maureen Fitzgerald from the Great Lakes MHTTC. I think we'll wait just another minute or two for more people to join our webinar today. Thanks so much for filling out the poll. I see we have a lot of nurses joining us. All right, I think we'll get started. Again, this is Maureen Fitzgerald from the Great Lakes Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, The Nurse's Role in Treating People with Persistent and Severe Mental Illness with Dr. Gina Bryan. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Great Lakes MHTTCC. We're one of 10 regional mental health technology transfer centers aligned with the Health and Human Services region across the United States. In addition, we have two national focus area, MHTTCCs, serving the American Indian and Alaska Native population, and also the Hispanic and Latino population. And we also have a network coordinating office based at Stanford University. We're funded by SAMHSA, and the Great Lakes MHTTCC, <laughs> sorry, TTC, serves Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. We are based at the UW-Madison. We're part of the Center for Health Enhancement System Studies. A few notes about our webinar today. This webinar will be recorded. It will be available for viewing at any time on our website and also on our YouTube channel. You'll be able to find the recording on our website and you see the address there. We're not uh, providing CEUs for, for this webinar today. A couple of other housekeeping items. The audio is being broadcast through your computer speakers, so make sure that they're turned on and up. There's no call-in phone number, and we invite you to use the question chat feature throughout the webinar to ask Dr. Bryan some questions. We'll also have a Q&A after the presentation. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Bryan, who's with the UW Madison Schools of Nursing and Pharmacy. She's the director of the Postgraduate Psychiatric Certificate Program and the mental health track of the Doctor of Nursing Practice Program. Dr. Bryan maintains an active clinical practice as a psychiatric advanced practice registered nurse at Rock County Human Services in Wisconsin. Her scholarship has been focused on assessment and treatment of substance use disorders and access for, for all to mental health treatment. Dr. Bryan, would you like to uh, get started? Yes, thanks so much for having me today. Um, I'm really excited to be a part of this conversation. Um, I, as you already heard, I am a proud nurse, and um, it's really been the great privilege of a lifetime to be able to work in um, mental health. Um, I, as, as Maureen introduced, I am faculty at the University of Wisconsin. Um, in Madison. I teach in the pharmacy school, nursing schools, and school of medicine and public health. I've been on faculty for seven years. Um, I've been an advanced practice psychiatric nurse for 16 years, and I've always worked in community psychiatry. So um, I've done some moonlighting inpatient, but predominantly have worked in outpatient county mental health centers, um, serving people with severe and persistent mental health issues. Um, comorbid substance issues, and um, I'm board certified both in pediatric mental health and adult mental health. So predominantly work with um, older adolescents to young adults um, with emerging thought disorders and um, severe and persistent mood disorders. So um, like I said, it's been the privilege of a lifetime. I'm exceptionally passionate about what I do. Um, to have the opportunity to teach as well as practice has really been a wonderful fit that I'm quite grateful for. And um, 
I also really appreciate, I, I always like to start when I have a conversation with people, um, really thanking the people that we serve. Um, all of you in the audience list, I'm sure have spent periods of time throughout your professional career where you've been able to work with people that live with significant mental health and substance abuse challenges. And in doing that work, I don't know if there's any way not to become affected by what you see. And what I mean by that is it really, the amount of strength, courage, and um, fortitude it takes to walk into a room of strangers and share your story it is really something. And it continues to motivate me. And I think I always like to give um, a thank you at the beginning of any conversation because much of what I've learned has been at the hands and generosity of the people we serve, being willing to tell their story and being able to help me better understand ways to better serve. So. I think it's really important to say because the amount of courage and the tenacity I see in the people I serve is, is really something, and I'm sure we can all concur with that. So in starting, I want to give a couple um, pieces of information before I start. I am currently talking from my office in Madison, Wisconsin, which is living through a pretty loud thunderstorm. So if you hear some thunder or lightning in the background, you won't hear any lightning, but if you hear thunder in the background, that is because we are live and there is a bit of a thunderstorm right now in Madison. Um, also, I tend to talk pretty quickly, so please feel free in the chat. If I'm talking too fast, just let me know. It's a little bit hard for me to do a webinar because I like moving and pacing around and um, I enjoy the kind of give and take in a conversation. Right now we have about 60 people listening in. Please feel free to use the chat room. I'll try to check it pretty regularly. Um, when we started the conversation with the poll today about what your background is, the attendee list is pretty heavily um, registered nurses. So I'm excited to see that. Um, in full disclosure, I prepared the, converse, the lecture for today to discuss um, some background information about nursing, so I apologize if some of it is basic for those of us in the room that are already nurses. Um, please feel free to add comments and questions, like I said, to make this conversation more robust. I'll repeat any questions you type. But um, I figure that we will go till about, oh, noon. Uh, maybe 10 minutes afternoon and leave time for any continued conversation. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Oh, I kept going to the wrong ear. All right, so today we're going to talk about different educational paths to become a professional nurse. We're going to talk a little bit about the nursing workforce, which certainly impacts nursing role in any area of healthcare. We're going to talk about various roles for nurses in mental health care and explore innovative models of mental health care and nurses' involvements within those models. Um, I put up here the Attic Mission. Um, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with this and have read this before. Um, and I, the reason I put this up here is as we talk throughout the next 40 to 50 minutes, I, I think a lot of what we talk about in, in the context of nursing really aligns well with the Attic Mission. Um, specifically for those of us in nursing that are um, PhD prepared or DNP prepared, a real focus of the work we've been trying to do in healthcare is more quickly move the evidence into practice. Um, as you all know, there is a huge lag time from when new information, new knowledge is formed in by researchers when it's put into practice, and that's a struggle in healthcare. Um, I think the other piece of that is the more clinicians um, that we have informing research questions, the better the outcome data is going to be in terms of use, and we'll talk some about that. Um, talking about the workforce that we have, um, that's going to be a, a focus of today and why I feel like many healthcare providers and clinicians are being underutilized, especially in mental health care. Um, this is an opportunity where regional and national alliances among culturally diverse practitioners, researchers, policymakers, funders, and the recovery community come together. And I think having webinars like this do a really good job of that. And I think leveraging technology to share information is really useful. Um, as we all know, we come from diverse communities, and interventions work best when they are 
geared towards the communities we serve in. In my career, I've worked in um, Milwaukee County, Dane County, which is Madison, which is predominantly made up of a large academic university community, and now in Rock County, which is um, the large cities of Janesville and Beloit, which were significantly impacted by the closure of GM plants. Those are really different communities, and although I use evidence-based um, interventions at all times, there are ways to make those fit the community I serve in better so that it aligns more with what's important to the people I'm serving. Um, and I think ways we share information and the way we use evidence can still be really funded in the, uh, in really built on a foundation of the science and the evidence, but there can still be um, allowances made for what goes on in those communities and what most impacts those communities. Um, a great example of that is we know communities are impacted differently by different substances. Um, you know, I'll frequently use Wisconsin examples because that's what I'm most familiar with, but our two largest cities in Wisconsin are Madison and Milwaukee, and those cities do not, when you look at the numbers, have significant, as significant an impact with methamphetamines in their practice, whereas the rest of the state has huge impact from methamphetamines. And so although some of the substance use and recovery interventions, I mean, substance services and recovery interventions we use fall for all substance use disorders. There are certainly um, clinical pearls and intricacies for working with people that are predominantly using opioids and alcohol versus those that are predominantly using methamphetamines. And so um, those are salient points and that, will, um, that I think have to be considered at all times. I also want to point out for the purposes of this conversation that I use the term mental health or psychiatry frequently, um, and in that I am also considering substance use disorders, which are a part of um, mental health in the larger medical picture. So every time I talk today, I'm not necessarily going to separate those out, and if I'm purposely trying to, I'll actually name the, the disorders I'm talking about. A uh, bit of background, which many of you I'm sure already know, 56 million Americans live with mental illness or substance use disorders currently in the United States. When we say 7.8% of people ages 12 years and older experience a substance use disorder per year, meaning they meet the criteria for a substance use disorder. 7.8% may seem low, but when you're talking about 20.1 million people, um, we get a better feel of what that impact actually is. 40% um, of 13 to 17-year-olds experience a behavioral health problem by the time they reach seventh grade. Um, new data just emerged both in the state of Wisconsin and federally uh, about teenagers, so um, polling high school students, and over approximately 47% of them identified as living with significant issues around anxiety. And why I think this is so important is when we talk about intervention and scope of programs, we really, really need to more seriously consider how early we're intervening and reaching out. So later on, one of the things we're going to talk about are school-based interventions. 10.7%, about 3.7 million of young adults experience an alcohol use disorder and 7% using illegal substances as of 2016. Mental health needs in the United States. 75% of U.S. counties have a shortage of any type of mental health worker. And 96% of counties in the United States have unmet, health, unmet need for mental health prescribers. The care gap is most profound in rural states with 111 million people living in mental health professional shortage areas. Re really, the purpose of this slide is to just acknowledge the shortage of healthcare providers we have. And, and what I can't stress enough is that where um, I, I want to give a shout out very clearly to primary care providers and other mental, uh, medical professionals, whether that be social workers, nurses, physician, occupational therapists, primary care is doing the heavy lifting of mental health care. 93% of psychotropic medications are prescribed by somebody that is not board certified in psychiatry or psych mental health nursing. And so I, I give so much um, respect and gratefulness to my colleagues that are carrying a very heavy burden 
with very t short time windows of seeing people. A general primary care appointment is anywhere between 15 and 20 minutes, and our colleagues are trying to manage metabolic syndromes, hypertension, and then really significant mental health and substance abuse issues. That model doesn't work. And so I think we as, as substance use and mental health professionals really need to consider that when we're talking about interventions and best practices. We're going to have to be more creative because although we're working really hard, hard on our ends in academics to develop more providers in these areas, um, there is, it, it's not going to be enough. And we have to, along the way, be hitting this issue from a lot of different directions. Two-thirds of primary care providers report difficulty referring patients for any mental health care. That's twice the number reported for any other health care specialty. So yes, specialty care is hard to get in in general, but when you're referring, primary care providers really acknowledge that mental health and substance use is where they can, cannot get services or the services are such long waits that it's really disheartening. What we know clearly from the evidence is people make change um, when they're ready to make change, and that striking while the iron's hot is really important, and that we need to meet people where they're at. When they build up the courage, when they get the resources together to be able to reach out for help and say they're willing to engage in, in help and support, we need to be able to intervene at that time. And currently, we're not able to do it for all the reasons we said in this slide about the shortage, and now in this slide about not having places to refer. Um, the number of people going to hospital emergency departments seeking psychiatric services increased 42% over a recent three-year period. I was an emergency room nurse for years when I was going to graduate school to become a psychiatric um, nurse practitioner, and also when I was in um, getting my doctoral um, degree. And what I can tell you is that um, psychiatric services provided in the ER aren't good psychiatric services. And that's not because um, those people that work in the emergency department don't care. It's because crazy, the emergency rooms aren't set up to provide evidence-based mental health and substance abuse um, services and prevention and um, decreased use and need plans. It's meant to, be, to re respond to crises in, in very intense times in a short manner with quick turnaround. And so we all know that, but yet this is where a large percentage of the people we need to get to are either having a first encounter or repeated encounter. I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here. Healthcare must be multi multidisciplinary care. So although our focus is going to be on nursing today, please don't take that as me stating that nurses are at the foundation or are the linchpin of any of this. What I'm saying is there is a role for nurses within healthcare and within, specifically within mental health care, and we need all hands on board. This meant the, the, the situation we are in in terms of the needs of the country and globally around psychiatric care and substance abuse care is great. We do not have people, enough people with expertise in this area to be doing this work. So it's on all of us to be able, one, to practice to the full extent of our scope, training, and education. We need, we're all responsible for recruiting those providers that are coming next after us. What I mean by that is precept students, what I mean, and yes, of course, as a faculty, I'm always looking for preceptors. But when you love what you do, there is no one better to teach the next generation of people coming up. Think back to when you chose to do this work. I clearly can name the people that I saw doing this work that I said that I saw myself in. I saw my colleagues that were psychiatric nurse practitioners, psychiatrists master prepared social workers in mental health, psychologists, who I said, that's what I want to do, and that's how I want to do it. I want to be that invested. I want to be that ethical. I want to be that kind of advocate. So if you love what you do, please, please, please consider bringing up the next generation of people who are also going to love what they do. 
and, and fight for this work because what I say, nursing has a huge need for nurses. But when I teach, I always say, we don't need just more nurses. We need more exceptional nurses. We need more nurses passionate about what they're doing. So um, I, I can't state that enough. What do we all know about mental health services? We know that a big change happened in the 1950s. What happened in the 1950s? Deinstitutionalization. What was a big underpinning for deinstitutionalization? Um, antipsychotic medication. The first generation antipsychotics came out in the 1950s. What we saw for the first time was people being able to have um, longer periods of time without symptoms um, and be able, people being able to function outside of institutional settings. When I say that, that's a mass generalization. There were a lot of intricacies, I mean, um, excuse me, a lot of specifics that played into this beyond solely antipsychotic medications. There was also an ethical movement for not institutionalizing people. There was emergence of data that people did better outside of institutions. But what I will tell you is that, um, it, it, you know, like I said here, there were improvements in psych treatment, an emphasis on human rights and the understanding of detrimental effects of institutionalization. There was the influence of the therapeutic community coming forward and saying we have more to offer on an outpatient basis. And there were the needs of people living with severe and mental health and or addiction can rarely be met by a single individual. So what we recognize is it can't be just in an institutional medical setting, that there needs to be involvement from case managers, from therapists. Um, and that we could offer this in an outpatient setting. Um, we need access not just to physicians, but to psychologists, social workers, nurses, occupational therapists, and other professionals. What we also know is that when deinstitutionalization happened, we did not necessarily have the pieces in place that we know we need when people leave. Um, I've also spent time working in corrections, and many people that come out of correctional settings um, also live with um, what I would consider symptoms of institutionalization, being used to a set schedule, having difficulty securing housing, having difficulty securing outpatient treatment. Um, and we saw this. And so we are still dealing with the after effects of deinstitutionalization, which were high rates of homelessness for people living with severe and persistent mental illness, as well as the correctional system becoming the largest institution serving people in this country with mental health issues and substance abuse issues. So um, we have a lot of work still to do, but it's an important acknowledgement of what happened um, in that time that um, the consequences of which we're still dealing with. What is the good news is that we have found interventions that the evidence has shown really clearly move the needle on people's quality of life and move the needle on decreasing the symptoms of the illnesses that people live with. And what do I mean by that? Um, I mean that we are seeing ACT programs or CSP programs that do a phenomenal job of um, supporting people and their goals living in the community. Um, we have community-based interventions that um, do those same things. And what we know are the teams that are multidisciplinary and can offer a range of services that people can access when they're ready and when they see value in them are the most beneficial. Nursing is a profession. What makes nursing a profession? It, what makes nursing a profession is there is a standalone, independent body of knowledge and um, nursing theory that is the foundation of nursing education. Nursing also has a scope and standards of practice statement, which all nurses must adhere to. And so professional nursing um, has a practice statement. We also have a code of ethical standards. And what that code is is our contract with society, so the contract between society and the nursing profession that says what society can expect from professional nurses. Um, and nursing's response to this contract is to provide care for all who are in need, regardless of their cultural, culture, social, or economic standing. So it's really important that we recognize nursing as a, a profession and a profession that brings its own um, individualized area, area of practice and, educate, and um, excuse me, competencies. Now, all nurses have to acknowledge we've created a bit of a dilemma for ourselves, what I like to call the alphabet soup of nursing. We have 
all different levels of education and scope of practice. So we have CNAs, LPNs, RNs, which are ADNs or BSNs, APRNs, DNP, PhDs. So we're going to talk about these a little bit. Um, and there are differences between these. And even within the nursing and healthcare community, people can't often make the distinction between these, um, which can be problematic when we're looking to find the right people with the right training and education to do a job. Um, and sometimes what happens is nurses tend to be underutilized in many settings because there's a lack of understanding what nurses can do, even within our own um, within our own profession. So let's start with certified nursing assistants, or CNAs. Um, CRNA, CNAs assist with activities of daily living and other healthcare needs under direct supervision of an RN or an LPN, so a registered nurse or a licensed practical nurse. Um, CNA re educational requirements is that they must have a high school diploma or GED. They must have a nursing assistant training that they completed, which was approved by the State Board of Nursing, of which that program is located in. And that CNA must also pass a certification examination that has both a written and a clinical skills exam. CNAs are most frequently found working in hospitals or long-term care facilities, such as nursing homes. Um, we don't see as much use of um, CNAs in psychiatric or mental health settings, um, mostly only, again, in nursing homes where people may live with mental health symptoms or in hospital settings. I do think this is an area where we can see some growth. And what do I mean by that? We're seeing more issues, of, um, excuse me, we're seeing more examples of um, peer support specialists being used in mental health. We won't have time today to, to talk about many of those models, but I'm sure most of you are familiar with new models emerging. And I think there are ways to fold in um, certified nursing assistants um, with some specialized training into these roles as well. These are people that have identified as being um, interested in care of individuals, um, and they, some of the training mirrors well um, such things as taking blood pressures, um, doing basic assessment of what kinds of needs people will have. And I think there's roles for this, um, and again, in peer specialist work um, and other areas of um, management. Where we do see some um, struggles at times is when healthcare facilities or organizations identify nursing assistants as nurses. Um, this is, does not solely happen for nursing assistants. Um, for example, um, when I take my children in to see their pediatric nurse practitioner for appointments, generally the people that room, for lack of a better term, us or bring us back, maybe ask a few questions to start the appointment, are nursing assistants or medical assistants. And often um, we, people get that confused and believe that that might be a nurse that's checking them in. Um, and when organizations don't use transparency in disclosing who people are seeing patients, um, it can be confusing and mixed. And um, often people that don't have a knowledge of what nurses can do believe that some of these roles are interchangeable. And today I want to talk a little bit about why I would argue they're not. And the evidence shows us really clearly that you need to have the right um, fit of um, nurses or the nursing continuum of providers for certain roles, or there can be some safety issues. Um, for example, the example we always use is, or that I think is really meaningful, is that when you look at hospital units and who they staff their units with, um, if the registered nurses are bachelor prepared nurses, and if they have um, a certain percentage of nurse per patient, or excuse me, a ratio of nurse to patient, those units have lower mortality and morbidity, and um, their outcome data and change of behavior is significantly better. That is not to say that there are not roles for associate prepared nurses or CNAs or licensed practical nurses. What it is to say is that you do have to look at the mix and you do have to look at what roles and jobs they are taking on in certain settings. So this um, sets us up for our continued conversation. Licensed practical nurses or LPNs support the core healthcare team and work under the supervision of an RN, APRN, or MD. Or I shouldn't say just MD or physician, a DO is as well. Um, they can check vital signs and look for signs that health is deteriorating or improving, although they don't do registered nursing assessments. 
The LPN education is graduating from an accredited LPN program with one year of coursework and practical application at a vocational, technical school, or community college. The key responsibilities of the LPN are to perform basic nursing functions, but not nursing assessment, and they may administer medications in some settings. And there's both state and federal law around what those settings are and where they can be. Registered nurses perform physical exams and health histories, health promotion, counseling and education, administer medication and other personalized interventions, coordinate care in collaboration with a wide array of healthcare professionals. Again, that is grossly under-explained, as all these roles are, but it's just to give an introduction. There are two ways to become a registered nurse. You can do that through an associate degree as a registered nurse from an accredited school, and then you have to pass the NCLEX exam, or a bachelor's degree in nursing from an accredited program. And you also have to pass the NCLEX exam. People often ask if the NCLEX exam is different from an associate's degree or a bachelor prepared nurse, and it is not. Um, so they take the same NCLEX examination. Um, again, the bachelor degree RN and the associate degree RN um, have the same number of clinical hours that they have to complete. Um, and we'll talk briefly about the education of these two roles and where there's some differences. Then we have the advanced practice registered nurse, which is not an educational attainment. That is, um, an educational attainment is either a master's degree or a doctoral degree. And an APRN must hold at minimum a master's degree in nursing and must be a registered nurse. So anyone who is identified as an APRN must have also be a registered nurse. Their responsibilities include treatment and diagnosis of illnesses. They have an independent license and practice, and they can. Pre and one of the key functions is the need for APRN. Uh, not functions. One of the key points we're going to talk about today is the need for APRN to practice to the full extent of their training, education, and experience. If we're going to improve access um, to treatment. Um, both in primary care and mental health care. There's four roles of APRNs. There is preparation as a nurse practitioner, a clinical nurse specialist, a certified nurse midwife, and a certified registered nurse anesthetist. All of those four roles have to, at minimum, have the, point, the bullet points listed above. What I'd also like to pr point out is there are other advanced practice nurses. There are nurses who work in public health who have a master's in public health that are advanced practice nurses. There are advanced practice nurses who work in education, that have their master's degree in, in education. Um, there's nurses that are advanced practice nurses that serve as diabetes nurse educators. What I want to point out is that the APRN role, which is a national term, are those nurses that are going to be providing direct patient care. Um, not all APRNs choose to have prescriptive authority, but all have the ability to. Um, and th those are some of the distinctions that, um, that I want to make around the APRN. Then there's the doctorally prepared nurses. There's two ways to become doctorally prepared um, nurses, and that is a PhD, which is a research doctorate, or a doctor of nursing practice, which is a clinical doctorate. Um, the master's degree is still the entry level for advanced practice registered nurses, those that are going to be doing but the um, direct patient care. The terminal degree is now a doctor of nursing practice, and we'll talk a little slightly about the educational preparation of those two roles. Um, I am a doctor of nursing practice. Um, I was already an advanced practice psychiatric nurse, so I'd been practicing as a psychiatric nurse practitioner for some years before I went back and did a postgraduate doctor of nursing practice. And the focus of my doctor of nursing practice was in health policy. Um, and so there's different ways to get to the end goal, but the, the, the point of focus today is that um, if you are looking for an advanced practice registered nurse to provide care in psychiatry, you're looking for an advanced practice registered nurse who is board certified in psychiatric mental health nursing as a nurse practitioner. If you're looking at program development, if you're looking at quality improvement, if you're looking at translational research, then maybe you're looking for a doctor of nursing practice who has training and education in all of those areas 
as well as clinical training as um, an advanced practice nurse. In some cases, and in other cases, they might be prepared as an educator or um, as a nurse administrator and then have a DNP in leadership, health policy, or some other area. So those are distinctions you'll want to be looking at as you're looking for players um, at your clinical table, a multidisciplinary team. Um, nursing, our numbers. There's over 4 million registered nurses in the United States. One in every 100 people is a registered nurse. RNs are in every community providing expert care from birth to end of life. And nurses are the largest group of healthcare providers of any group of um, educated and trained healthcare providers. There is a nursing shortage. Um, by 2020, the total number of RNs will not meet the demand for the workforce number required. Pieces of that are the aging nurse, working nurse force, and then there are some other outside extraneous um, factors that are playing on it that we'll talk about today. Um, it's important to talk a little bit about where nurses fall in terms of income, whether you're a program designer, whether you're a nurse yourself, to get an idea of if we hire a nurse, what's kind of the going rate. And as nurses, um, I think we need to know as we recruit um, potential future nurses into this program. The median salary across the United States is $68,450,000 in 2017. Um, the best paid 10% of nurses made $102,000, almost $103,000 a year, and the bottom paid 10% bottom paid 10 earned less than $47,000 a year. The most common um, entry-level education for registered nurses is the bachelor degree. Wisconsin nurses are 56% bachelor educated, and um, of your cooperative, um, of the five states involved in it, that's approximately the same data. So they're over the 50% mark for bachelor's prepared nurses. Some states have less than 50%, but not in the five that are part of this collaborative. The number of jobs available in 20, uh, 2016 is 2,857,180. Why did I put that statistic up there? Is because there's a lot of jobs out there. Um, it is often difficult to find a registered nurse to come work in the places we serve and work for. And what we do know is that for registered nurses in general, those that work in mental health nursing are paid less than other areas. That is not true any longer for advanced practice registered nurses. For, for those psychiatric nurse practitioners, the pay has gone up significantly in the last um, five years and certainly the last 10 years. Um, so they are more competitive for pay, and they've needed to be because there is such a significant shortage. Um, the states that pay the highest salaries are California, Hawaii, Massachusetts, Alaska, and the state of Oregon. Um, briefly, in the state of Wisconsin, I'm using this data because the state of Wisconsin actually has the most robust um, workforce data, and luckily the five states that we're serving in mirror each other pretty closely. Um, there's 79,000 RNs in the workforce um, that work in Wisconsin, so almost 80,000 nurses work in Wisconsin as of 2018. The points I want to draw you to are, that are pretty pressing and I think pretty relevant to our conversation is that 60% of nurses are over the age of 40, so we have an aging workforce. 95% um, of nurses that are educated in Wisconsin stay in Wisconsin, and that mirrors itself around the United States. So what we know is that if you educate nurses in your state, they will stay in your state to work. And that it is also mirrored by nurses that come from rural communities. This is true across all healthcare professionals. Well, I, what I can speak to very specifically is pharmacy, nursing, and medicine. If the students we recruit come from rural communities, they, t they are more likely to go back and serve in those rural communities. Um, so that's important when you're looking at models of development to engage nurses um, and other healthcare providers. I would not be surprised, but, but I can't say for certain that that mirrors um, all of the areas we work in, psychologists, social workers, but it certainly does for healthcare providers. 
Um, half of all nurses are employed in hospitals as their primary employer, so 52.1%. Um, I'm hoping we'll see somewhat of a shift in it because there is great need in our communities in all areas of healthcare. And we know that when we get more nurses in the community, it speaks more to prevention. And I, I think that's really important to all of us. Um, please note that 94% of nurses are white in Wisconsin, 92% are female, and 95% speak only English. Why is that important? It's important because what we know is that when we look more like the people we serve, the better health outcomes are. So nursing has got an issue. We don't look like the people we're serving. And um, we don't have time today, and one of my favorite topics to talk about is why nurses look like this. Um, and what I mean by look like that is identify in the numbers the way they do here around being white females that only speak English. Um, because our demographics are changing in the United States and our, um, we need to see those demographics changing in the professions we're a part of. So when I speak to nursing, um, we're working really hard to look at why we're this way and how we can do a better job of letting people know how important um, this, this work is and how wonderful this work is, and we'll, we'll see changes. What we do know is that the pay of, when the pay, as the pay of nursing increased, we started um, seeing more men come into the field. Um, as we saw the Johnson & Johnson um, ads targeting people that didn't look like um, white females that speak only English, um, we started to see uptick. The military has a high level of, um, a high number of men who serve as nurses, and our acute care units have a high level, uh, a number of men that serve in nursing. So um, as we see currently at the UW-Madison where I teach, um, which is a big program in a top 20 ranked school of nursing in the country, we're up to 20% men in our um, program. It's still too low. Um, but we worked really hard to get there, and we continue to work on it. Now, the issue is not if, um, I, I think something that's been really exciting about nursing and higher education is that it's heavily female, when a lot of other areas of education, I mean of higher ed, didn't have um, women. But what we know is that we want all workforces to look more representative of um, our community, and so that's important. Nursing is the one, has been for every year except 2002 the highest rated profession for honesty and ethics, 17th consecutive year. So why didn't we get it in that year? It was because of 9-11 and um, firefighters and rescue workers got the most trusted um, profession. And so um, this feels good. It feels good to work in a profession where honesty, integrity, and ethics are not questioned, and to be rated as the highest feels like a good um, confirmation. As you can see high on that list are medical doctors, pharmacists, teachers, police officers, um, you know, really, really important roles. Um, so great, great. Nursing's done a good job of this. but. Next slide. We got a big problem. I always say I, I really appreciated being considered ethical, really appreciate being considered people that can be trusted. So where's the disconnect? Why isn't nursing at the table? And what do I mean by that? There was a beautiful study out of Vanderbilt by Dr. Peter Beerhouse, who's in a nurse and has his PhD in economics. And he's made a career out of, he's no longer at Vanderbilt. He's actually semi-retired and is working at a horse farm in Wyoming. But um, in 2014, he did a really important study. He'd been looking at the economics of healthcare environments and more specifically at nursing within that. What we know is nurses are the largest group of healthcare providers. They're the group of healthcare providers that get the most face time with patients. They're the group of healthcare providers that um, have a really um, um, diverse educational background where they're getting qualitative and quantitative research, quality improvement, public um, anatomy and physiology, pharmacology, and then public health um, education, and again, like I said, quantitative and qualitative research. Um, so this, this really robust educational background. 
And he surveyed healthcare leaders and decision makers, which were the terms used in his study. Those were CEOs, COOs, CFOs, program developers, and um, ask them who they bring into the room when they're making programs, when they're making decisions about healthcare. And they got back the data, and the data showed some really good things. They brought in physicians, they brought in pharmacists, they brought in um, program developers, social workers, they brought in um, really, they brought in facilities managers that talked about the physical space of these entities, but who they didn't bring in were nurses. We weren't on the list. And do I say that to say, oh, poor us? No, I say that because for all the reasons I just listed, when you leave out a group of healthcare providers that have the kind of educational background, um, the credibility amongst the people we serve and the ear of the people we serve, th that's a big loss. As a healthcare leader, I would say, I want those people at the table. And nursing's got to start to take some, and, and we could go back on the historical rationale from this. We can talk about some gender issues of who's at the table and what nursing's look like over our history. So yes, I don't want to uh, belittle that or say that doesn't play a part, but nursing's got to take some hold and get ourselves into these tables. So um, it's a really important point that I, I don't want to overlook. When we talk about education of a bachelor prepared nurse, we're talking about um, a liberal education for baccalaureate generalist nursing practice. There's organization and system leadership for quality care and patient safety. And these are the essentials to be accredited as a bachelor prepared school of nursing. There's evidence-based practice information management and application of patient care technology, so informatics, healthcare policy, finance, and regulatory environments, interprofessional communication and collaboration for improving patient health outcomes. So required and essentials now, all of our BSN students have to be involved in interprofessional education. It's part of our accreditation process. That's true for pharmacy and medicine as well through their accrediting bodies to be a school of pharmacy or school of nursing. I mean medicine, excuse me. Clinical prevention and population health and professionalism and professional values. For the master's degree in nursing, accreditation essentials require the background for practice from sciences and humanities, organization and systems leadership, quality improvement and safety, translating and integrating scholarship into practice, so we're talking about that translational research, informatics and healthcare technologies, health policy and advocacy, interprofessional collaboration for improving patient and population health, and clinical prevention and population health for improving health. And again, background for practice in sciences and humanities, remember, that's advanced pathology, I mean, advanced physiology, advanced assessment, advanced pharmacology. Um, and so it's really important that um, we recognize what is really a unique and wide breadth of education. As I said, the entry level for advanced practice registered nurses is the master's level. The DNP is the terminal degree. And what the DNP additionally offers is scientific underpinnings for practice, organization and systems leaders for QI and systems thinking, evidence-based practice for scholarship and analytical methods, information systems and technology and patient care technologies for improvement and transformation of healthcare. So it takes it to that next level healthcare policy and advocacy in healthcare, interprofessional um, collaboration for improving patient and population health outcomes, and clinical prevention and population health. Um, I'm getting a couple questions about um, the mental health certificate program, um, which I will talk about more, but in context of education, we do at UW-Madison have a postgraduate certificate, and what that is is for those people who already are prepared as nurse practitioners, they either have a master's or a doctor in nursing practice, and they might be working in primary care, women's health, pediatrics, geriatrics, and they want to come back for a postgraduate certificate, meaning they've already been practicing. They come back into our continuing education program. They do all the foundations coursework, all the um, clinical hours that are required in psychiatry, and then they can sit for board certification as a psychiatric nurse practitioner because they've already done all this other education that we've talked about at the master's or, or at the graduate level, excuse me, then they can come back and get the psych only 
coursework in a condensed manner. They still have to do all the clinical hours that would be expected, and then they sit for board certification. Um, psychiatric mental health nurses work in various settings, hospitals, outpatient clinics, home health care organizations, prisons, schools, public health, and that is not an exhaustive, exhaustive list. Mental health nursing grew out of the needs to have nurses work in hospitals asylums, so that's where nurses traditionally worked. And as early as the late 1800s, they, we began to see nursing education with a specific focus on, on mental health and psychiatry. So it's been there for a long time. As you saw, there is um, both the biology, physiology, and medical training, as well as these additional areas. Mental health nurses and psychiatric, excuse me, psychiatric mental health registered nurses and advanced practice nurses in psychiatry represent the second largest group of behavioral health professionals in the United States. The role of psychiatric mental health nurses is health promotion and maintenance, intake screening evaluation and triage, which is a really important part of nursing, case management, patient education, administer and monitoring of psychobiological treatment regimens, crisis intervention and stabilization efforts, educating patients, families, and communities in court coordination. So now for the next, we technically still have 40 minutes. I'd like to be able to leave the last 20 minutes for some time, but over the next 20 minutes, I'd like to talk about more specifically the role of the psychiatric nurse, um, both in treating mental health and substance abuse issues, and what are some unique perspectives I think nursing brings to the table. There's a really important role of a registered nurse case manager, which I've seen bearing out in a couple different settings. You could talk about the, re, re, um, the registered nurse case manager from an inpatient perspective and an outpatient perspective, both in community mental health settings, in um, psychiatric clinic settings, and in substance use treatment settings. So the coordinated um, care case manager registered nurse coordinates all aspects of care uh, of an individual. Um, it, he or she ensures proper utilization of services and resources, provides assistance with between outside facilities and organizations. The, he, um, case managers are expert at obtaining resources. They work with families and communities and other professionals. A large part of the role is advocacy. Case managers ensure patients receive medically appropriate services regarding private and public health insurance. They review charts and meet with other healthcare professionals to ensure that they're receiving appropriate levels of care, and they facilitate admissions and discharge processes. What can't be overlooked here is that one of the areas that we struggle with most are as people move between systems. And in mental health, that often means moves from medical systems to mental health systems. Um, I sometimes don't like the distinction between medical and mental health because I think it parlays into increased stigma, but um, we still organize ourselves in organizational settings around medical care and mental health care. Often what happens is when people move from medical units to psychiatric units or are discharged from psychiatric units back into the community, we, we see that there is a lack of adherence to continued care or people kind of fall through the cracks, for lack of a better term, and there's a lack of coordination between what might be their substance abuse services with their diabetes services with their therapy services for mental health issues, and often we don't, even though these things are extremely linked, and the outcomes and the progress in one of these areas seriously impacts their outcome and progress in other areas, there's not a lot of coordination. What I think case management can certainly be provided by social workers, by psychologists, from a lot of different professionals, but today my role was to talk about nursing. And what I think nursing brings to the table is this background on the medical side and the mental health care side. And nurses are trained to be really good triagers, um, trained and educated in this way. So how do we, and, and we're also trained in patient education really strongly, that's part of the foundation of nursing, and how to engage families, communities, and the individual on all of these different levels. So um, this care role of the case manager is really important, and there's a lot of novel ways to do this. 
Um, and we'll talk about some of those. But how we um, can best utilize care managers and case managers, I think, is, again, the involvement. You know, we always have discharge coordinators in the hospital setting, and it's a really important role. But often what doesn't happen is beyond the sheet of paper somebody gets when they're dis um, when they're being discharged is here's your piece of paper, here's your appointment, but how do people get to those appointments? Has anybody talked to them about transportation? Has anybody talked to them about what their reading level is when they get that sheet of paper? What do we know about health literacy material? We know that most of it and informed consent materials are written at a late high school, if not early post high school level. What's the average reading level in the United States? Fourth grade. What's the average reading letter for the people we see in a community mental health setting that may be uninsured or undershirt? It's second to third grade. So a lot of what we give people isn't at where they need it to be. We're starting to learn better things about using technology, using text messages, using um, apps to remind people, looking at ways to manage, manage medication adherence. And I think this is where registered nurse case managers can really come into play. Go back to the slide on education. Part of our core essential at the bachelor level, master's, and doctoral level are information systems, interprofessional education, learning what other roles do. Nursing can do that more than most other professions. And it's not that it's the only profession that can do it, but it's part of our core foundation. We're taught about individuals, not only as individuals, but as the source, uh, but as their role as part of communities and, and part of families. And so when we look at that, you're really well positioned. The other thing we can see is right now, meant, um, Alcohol and drug treatment services are often siloed from mental health services, and I think this case manager role can really be integrative and innovative. One is how to bring these teams together and how to really start looking at developing programs where this is more integrated. We have to get to that part, and I'm sure many of you on the call have some really innovative and integrative programs. Um, one of my roles currently is I'm serving on the National Academies of Science and Engineering Medicine on the six-person working task force on CARA legislation, which is a Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. And part of our role is to look at all the current legislation and the pilot projects that are being funded through Congress to see how things are um, working and where we can make innovations. And what I'll tell you is I'm the first nurse to ever serve on the National Academy of Science and Engineering and Medicine and um, in, in this role around mental health. And um, why I think that's important has nothing to do with me, but it has to do with the fact that when we bring nurses to the table the, and diversify that table, there are psychologists serving. There are people with a background in social work. There are um, medical physicians serving. And so I think that um, widening that brings some of this to the table. What about inpatient registered nurses? They do assessment, management of treatment plans, run groups, unit milieu management, patient education. Okay, what I will tell you is many of you have had interactions or perhaps I know a lot of people early on that were part of this call are nurses, and many of you maybe have served as nurses on inpatient units. Um, what I will um, say is that in inpatient psychiatric units, nurses are being way underutilized. Yes, there are important roles in business of the unit that needs to go on, and management of the milieu on a unit is heavily relied upon nurses for. But where we see some innovation, but not certainly enough of, are running medication groups, running discharge groups. What are you going to do when you leave here? And by medication groups, not only infor uh, informing patients about the specific medications, but really med adherence. Where do you keep your medicines once you're at home? What do your medicines look like? Can you tell me the names of all your meds? Not asking people, do you take your meds? Because people say yes, and they mean it, and they're being upfront. But when I ask a person, how many days in the last seven have you forgotten to take your meds once or twice? Everybody raises their hand on that question. And if they're hitting they forgot two or three times, which doesn't sound that much, they're missing their medications half the time. So nurses need to be the ones to educate people about appropriate ways to ask questions. Don't ask people if they're sleeping, because they'll either say yes or no. And, when, and it's much more complicated than that. People come in every day to me and say, Gina, I haven't slept in days. I'm not sleeping in weeks. Almost none of them are not sleeping for days or weeks because their body would physiologically exhaust. We can't function as human beings like this. 
What they mean is I'm having fitful sleep, I'm having poor sleep, and we can be utilizing registered nurses' times on unit much more effectively. Somebody asked the question, is, do I feel nurses have enough information about mental health issues in order to advocate for the patient? Is mental health first aid part of nursing courses? NAMI has a presentation called Our Own Voices. Great question. I do have some slides about that coming up. The answer is no. I teach in the undergraduate doctoral program and on, cam on campus, like I said, in pharmacy and nursing. There is woefully um, um, a, a, a deficit of mental health and education. Again, we're training generalists at these levels, and there's so much to cover. But what you'll hear is not only is there a shortage of um, psychiatric nurses, physicians, and pharmacists, there is a shortage of faculty with expertise in these areas. And there is some school of thought that if you've been a nurse, well, then you have um, enough education and training to talk about psych nursing because we all deal with psychiatry and mental health issues in nursing. There is truth to that, but it doesn't make you an expert and it doesn't make you love mental health. And I would argue that having people that love mental health teach mental health, one, you get the content across better and you excite people into providing better mental health services. So no, they don't get enough training. What I would hope is that those nurses that identify as working, wanting to work in mental health and take these roles do the good job we all have to do about continuing education, which is required for advanced practice nurses. Your state may or may not require continuing education for registered nurses. Many boards of nursing are arguing that all should, but I can tell you the state of Wisconsin does not require continuing ed. But there are ways to be a good professional and an ethical professional, and that is looking at evidence-based care, being innovated. The best units I have seen when I've gone around and done consulting or I've worked on different units are those units where nurses engage. They see themselves as part of the leadership and treatment team. They have phenomenal nurse managers who engage and create new interventions based on evidence and try to implement them. There are, um, we do, I, when I teach the undergrad psych course, we do use the NAMI mental health first aid. When I work in different settings, you know, using NAMI as a resource for teaching, um, yeah, it's, it's really important and um, it is something that we absolutely need more training in and we need, it is part of essentials in nursing, but that's only as good as the school or the faculty that puts it in place, as we know. But essentials are definitely a place to start. Um, CSPs, community support programs, is what we call them in Wisconsin. Other states refer them as ACT teams, so assertive community treatment registered nurses. By law, all community support programs and ACT team have to have a registered nurse as part of their team. Um, what registered nurses do in these settings is bridge between case management and medical care, often providing both. Um, when I was a CSP nurse, I did have a, 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 t a group of um, people I served on my care team, and then I worked as a nurse. So part of my role was doing, for lack of a better term, shot clinics, medication education. At that time, I was not advanced practice nurse, so joining the prescribing appointments and playing that conduit role. But my job was also triaging a lot. Yeah, I would be going out with my social work colleagues, my psychology colleagues, and, and screening people out in the community for what might be really serious medical concerns, what might be concerns of lack of adherence to medication, um, what might be concerns about doing a psych assessment to see if symptoms were coming back. Um, and so I think it's a really, really important role on these teams. And in saying that, I certainly spend time with my colleagues in therapy settings. When I work at community, I mean, at a county mental health center, I have a group of colleagues that are providing therapy for children and adults, and they might say, Gina, can you step in their room? I'm really concerned. Um, can you look at their skin? Is this a skin rash from the Lamotra gene that this person's taking? Or, Gina, uh, do you think maybe this person's intoxicated right now? Can you do a BAL? Can you do a P-test? Can you, you know, all these things that I think, um, and sorry, I'm not trying to offend anybody by saying P-test, it's something I say, but your intox screen. Um, can you do a blood pressure? And um, different levels of nurses can do this in all different ways, but what I have loved most about psychiatry is more so than any other area I've ever worked in, there is this interdisciplinary team. And nurses are really a part of it. And we do a better job of using nurses probably in mental health teams than we do in most area teams. Maybe palliative care does a really good job of it. Um, I think um, the community that works around cognitive disabilities really uses nurses well in some of their teams. And so, but there's definitely room for growth. Um, 
Um, I'd also say a lot of prevention gets overlooked because we're so desperately in need of providers and we're working so hard in many of the settings we serve to work with people that are already at a point of their illness that they, um, we often think, oh, prevention, you know, I'm just trying to deal with this crisis. A great example of that is people often come in and they're heavily using nicotine. We know with people with thought disorders, 90% of people diagnosed with a thought disorder, predominantly schizophrenia, live with a comorbid um, nicotine use disorder. And so um, often what I hear on a regular basis is that, oh, yeah, um, let's deal with one issue at a time. They're psychotic. I don't have time to deal with the nicotine use. We'll get to that later. And what all the evidence shows us is that when people identifying want to work on it, we need to hit them. And so there's no reason when I prescribe risperidone or a Sestena injection, paliperidone Sestena, that I can't also be offering a nicotine patch. There's good rationale for it, and the evidence really clearly shows that if you do those, that if you act when people ask, even when dealing with a severe and persistent mental illness, the rates of decreasing their nicotine use or stopping their nicotine use are significantly higher. So I think what um, nurses bring to the table is that kind of information and prevention. Initiating a med adherence group, a smoking prevention group, an exercise group, a mindfulness meditation group. Um, these are all kinds of things that we see as nurse-led interventions frequently, and I think are really exciting options. Um, registered nurses and corrections. The reason I put this up here because it's a really specific group is because um, the, in the United States, correction is still the largest service provider of mental health services. Um, we're seeing um, my research currently, uh, my research team is working on MAT, an increased um, access to MAT, medication-assisted treatment. And we're, what we're seeing in our state is some of the biggest groups of people have, getting access to MAT currently are in correctional settings. And they're coming out and getting shots at pharmacies, and we're looking at novel ways to um, provide injections and um, MAT services. So we're looking at pharmacies. And so um, nurses in corrections provide a high level of advocacy. And what we know about corrections is people are moving in and out of corrections. Sentences are slightly shorter. Young adults that go in are coming out. And for a lot of them, the only psychiatric services they've ever seen are once they get to corrections. And so as sad as that is, when I worked in corrections as a psychiatric nurse practitioner, for some of the people I was seeing, it was the first time they got good assessment for diagnosis around mental health and substance use disorders and where they were actually exposed and educated about the symptoms they were living with for long periods of their life. Oh, significant histories of trauma. For the first time, somebody was acknowledging that and talking to them about that. So it's really important. Um, Let's talk about some of these innovative roles of psychiatric nurses. I use the example of a nurse-led depression program that involved a trained nurse care manager. We talked about that role who works in collaboration with primary care providers, specializing in mental health care providers and other members of the interprofessional team to provide depression screening, outreach, and treatment. So this happened to be a she. How did she do this? Um, she was out in the community. And what they did is they looked at a home care setting um, where people were young adults were or young adults and children, late adolescents were living in um, essentially a group home. They did um, screens for depression, and then they connected them to service providers and did some preventative programs in the group home. What they found is that there were reduced depressive symptoms, lower rates of hospitalizations. Um, it was the short-term screening, one of the, the, the critical fact, I mean, excuse me, one of the ways to critique the study was that it was a short-term screening and referral for depression that was used, and so it didn't look at longer-term rates of depression, like out six months or a year. Um, you know what? I'm sorry, I'm mixing this up with the other study. I'm going to show you a very similar study. This is a home care setting for older adults. I'm sorry, I'm going to show you one for a group home, but this was actually in an older age for older adult homes. And they showed that these adults, again, with the depression screening and the connection to prevention groups and um, treatment groups, they had lower rates of hospital um, and um, quality of life increase and a reduction in the severity of the depression symptoms, and it costed nothing extra. It was cost neutral from what they were saving to the services provided. This was the community um, 
d d related um, intervention services provided by a community care nurse. It was a study of 154 adolescents, young adults to late adolescents. It was a six-month follow-up. Data was attained from 100 of the 154 people, so that's actually a pretty robust follow-up. And um, that there were two programs offered in the Santa Monica, California community. And what it was were three 45-minute group sessions, which covered HPV and HCV infections, HIV infection and transmission and prevention strategies. Talked about have and HIV vaccinations, and then training in self-management and communication skills to overcoming barriers to completion of the vaccine and reducing drug use behaviors and development of relationships, activities, and social networks. So this was really focused on substance use. The really great news is, is that um, almost all studies that looked at substance abuse that also measure depression and anxiety scales shows a decrease in use and in depression and anxiety. As you know, there's a lot of comorbidities between these. Anxiety and depression are very intricately woven. And so the good news is that no matter what, um, what we do for um, interventions around mental health and substance use, the good news is they often hit a lot. And as you know from research as well, we often have to study because re IRBs and research criteria require it that when we do studies on medications for psychosis, that it's a disqualifying if they have a comorbid substance use disorder or we have to get somebody that's only using opioids. In my 20 years of practice, I don't know that I can think of more than one or two people that were only using opioids. And I strongly call in the question if they were, right? Most of the people we see are also using alcohol, also using marijuana. Um, maybe you're throwing in a little methamphetamines, you know? So it's a complicated picture, and often our evidence doesn't take into account that because we, um, we narrow our end down so significantly, they no longer look like the people we serve. And that's a problem with research around mental health. I cannot speak enough about registered nurses in schools. So we don't have time to go over like all the roles registered nurses play in school, but what we do know is that when there are bachelor prepared nurses serving as nurses in school, outcome for those students are better around primary care access, management of chronic illnesses in children, vaccine rates, and mental health. We don't utilize registered nurses in schools much for mental health. What do I mean by that? Registered nurses in school will say the number one issue that comes to my door is mental health issues, and that's mirrored by the health aides in school. And let me tell you something. Students in elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools believe their health aides in their offices are nurses, and they almost never are. And why I think that's an important point is those brilliant young students that want to be nurses look at that and say, I don't want to be that. He or she doesn't seem to be able to answer my questions. So um, I can't say enough that we need to be transparent about who those nurses are in school, because there's usually one nurse for the entire district. And then there's health aides. We need more nurses in school, and we 100% need more mental health nurses in school. Um, one of the things I'm working really closely with the United Way in Dane County about is school-based clinics for mental health care. And there's some difficulty around that, around privacy and other issues. But what I can tell you is for ki kids can't get access to mental health services. Parents that have are, are spending large amounts of time leaving their jobs to get kids to appointments. Kids that are often in mental health services struggle with issues around truancy, missed days of school, being removed from school, and it's really, the kids I see don't go back to school after their appointment with me. They go home, and they miss more days of school, and they're already struggling with truancy. Yes, as you know, my practice is heavily people with really serious and, per and persistent mental health issues, so these kids are struggling anyway, but there are a lot of the kids we're seeing. And if I could bring back that statistic of 40% of kids in schools are saying that they are struggling intensely with um, anxiety, we need to be in the schools. And we need to be in the classrooms. We need to be teaching prevention. We should be in health classrooms talking about healthcare teachers don't have a lot of training around prevention, mental health issues, substance abuse. They don't get that training in their educational programs as health teachers. They need to be have nurses in there teaching these things. I think we're perfectly positioned for it. Um, they should be part of IEPs. I rarely get the time as a 
Psych NP for my patients to be part of their IEP. If I had a nurse partner in those schools that I was talking to regularly, they could be representing what we're doing in the psychiatric setting. There's some really exciting ways to be getting more mental health services into the school, and everything we are knowing, seeing, in all of our numbers screams for this. We could just talk about vaping, for God's sakes, and, and we need it. We need it. Um, the Psych Mental Health APRNA, APRN, I want to make a few points about this. There is a board certification for psych mental health nurse practitioners. Some settings use pediatric nurse practitioners or primary care nurse practitioners as psych mental health nurses. Where my colleagues in these areas do, as I stated early, a lot of the heavy lifting, I, I still believe there's a value and a place for board certification in psych because those of us that are working in psych are working with people. Um, we're, we're not working with them in primary care settings. We're serving people that weren't able to have their needs met in these settings already, and so I think the specialization in psych mental health is really necessary. So for those of you that are working in mental health settings and looking at adding psychiatric providers, please look for people board certified in psych when you're looking for advanced practice registered nurses. Um, you already know what APRNs do because we talked about that. I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about some of the policy around advanced practice registered nurses, and what do I mean by that? Every state dictates the scope of practice for um, healthcare providers. So you have a board of nursing that is responsible for scope of practice as well as the professional ethics of advanced practice nurses. Um, you have a board of medicine that does that for um, physicians. Um, currently, 23 states in the United States have full practice authority for advanced practice nurses, or almost at half. That means half the states still have some form of restriction to their practice. So the state of Wisconsin is one of those. Minnesota and Iowa both have full practice authority. Wisconsin does not. Wisconsin has what's called a collaborative agreement in our legislation that states advanced practice nurses need to have a collaborative agreement with the physician. It's very open-ended, which is wonderful. It means we can kind of create a practice. And in my practice, there's no supervision of my work. I have an independent practice. I have an independent prescribing license and a DEA number. But what it does is, if I was going to go open a nurse-run clinic um, in Lac de Flambeau, Wisconsin, I'd need a physician who is my collaborating physician and to sign on. And often what that becomes is a financial agreement where I'm paying somebody to do that with real no oversight. So at that point, it becomes a barrier. Also, for a really good example for those of us on this call is JAMA, which is the journal um, of, um, oh, I'm not going to get the words right, but JAMA, which is a non-nursing journal, it's a medical journal, just put out a study about um, accessibility to medication-assisted treatment for substance use disorders, and those states that had full practice authority had over 50% greater access to MAT so for those states that had full practice authority for advanced practice nurses and those that didn't put up huge barriers. Um, what I want to say, yes, yeah, the Journal of the American Medical Association, thank you, JAMA. And um, what's funny about that is JAMA and the American Medical Association is one of the big, um, it has been one of the um, strongest opponents to having full practice authority, but I think they're even coming to the point where they're saying, we can't move the needle on these issues unless we allow all people, psychologists, nurses, social workers, physicians, psych pharmacologists, to work to the full scope of their training, education, and standards. We have a scope of practice. We know what it is. And there are already mechanisms, safety mechanisms in place for the public for people to not work outside of their scope and practice. Um, so what I would say is that please advocate for full practice authority if you're really committed to improving access to all primary care, mental health, or all care. Um, OB-GYN services, that's another area where there's a huge shortage. So um, please consider it. Um, examples of some roles of the psychiatric APRN. Um, Ohio had a beautiful co-location project with primary care services. So there's two different models of access to care. There's a co-location where you put a psychiatric provider or prescriber on site um, in a primary care setting, and they can either provide consultative services to those primary care providers 
or the patient could be referred directly to that person who has an office in there. You can also reverse it and put primary care because what we know is many of the people we serve in predominantly primary care settings, like county mental health settings, they don't often have access to primary care, can't get in, or they will not go to primary care as a function of some of the struggles they have living with their severe and persistent mental illness or substance use. So when you co-locate a primary care provider in your mental health system, um, so that, that's, really, that's really good, I think, um, to, to be able to co-locate. There was an, a parent in New York that um, established a center for individuals who are, living, who are homeless and living with SMI, um, severe and persistent mental illness and substance use. It was staffed exclusively by a parent who provided both comprehensive medical health services and interventions to address social needs, such as housing. Um, data available on two years of the outcomes, lower levels of inpatient stay, and none of the clients in this study, which were over 100, were incarcerated, which is highly unusual in a homeless population. And I don't say this to say that only nurses can be doing this. They can't. A lot of us can engage in this. But what I am saying is this group is positioned for it, and evidence, multiple repeated studies show that nurses, more than any other group, serve in underserved areas, back in the communities they came from, in rural and underserved, um, rural and urban, excuse me, underserved communities. And I think there's a lot of reasons for it, but one for sure is definitely as all registered nurses, um, one of the tenets of nursing is social justice, and um, I think that can't be ignored. I just want to quickly say um, mental health DNP are also involved in quality improvement, translational research, health policy, and faculty um, to teach in um, most large universities, you, the minimum level of entry in um, graduate programs is the doctoral degree. Psychiatric nursing is affected by the nursing shortage, as we've talked about. I'll briefly say that, again, these are the biggest non-physician specialties. There's a demand for services that is continuing to go up, and um, these roles are growing quickly. We have a huge faculty shortage, and like somebody so brilliantly pointed out, when you don't have people that are experts in this teaching this, it's hard to engage people and fall in love with this work. So we still see students with a lot of stigma around mental health. They may view mental health people, people living with mental health issues or patients as depressing. These are the words used in the study, taking too long to see, um, putting themselves in situations that are often violent because there's this perception of violence and requiring more interpersonal connection with the patient than they would like or they feel skilled to give. Susans often see mental health nurses working on a unit, devoting much of their time to charting pills and paperwork. So when we don't do some of these innovative things and use, use it, nurses, it models for students that this is not something they want to go into. Um, obstacles, lack of understanding and appreciation of the skills and roles, the public's perception and the medical perception, and this is true for all areas of healthcare, that those people that go into psychiatry or mental health work are somehow don't have the skills or knowledge to go into what is considered more critical care work. That happens in primary care, too, that people within the field say, oh, medical providers um, that go into primary care or psychiatry just don't have the skills to do ICU or surgery, or so that that's a big falsehood, and um, it's a really disappointing falsehood. So um, I want to give time for some conversations. We have about eight minutes for discussion, um, and I'm I'm hoping we can um, look at some of these. So how do current case nurse managers mean salaries compared to those of RNs? Um, lower. Um, so nurse case man community nurses tend to get, I shouldn't say that, community case management nurses tend to get paid lower than inpatient nurses. Often people are okay with that because they're not doing every other night, we, I mean nights or weekends, and people will sometimes take a bit of a pay cut not to, have work, to work nights or weekends. However, I think we're seeing an equalizing of that as we recognize those roles um, need to be equivalent in order to recruit and get people to try these roles. Psychi nurses that work in psychiatry still, not in hospital settings necessarily, but still tend to be slightly lower paid than those in other areas. Again, that's not true for advanced practice nurses. Um, thoughts on certification for RNBSN nurses. So the, there is a mental health nursing certification for RNs board certified in psychiatry. Um, I'm not as familiar in the last five years with the curriculum. I have taught the curriculum in the past. I think it's wonderful. Um, what usually happens is inpatient hospital units 
or large psychiatric or psychi uh, mental health organizations will pay for their nurses to go as a group through this training. And it's really targeted and based on ANCC credentialing standards that goes over a whole scoop of knowledge. I don't find many individuals that are willing to pay because it's somewhat costly out of pocket to do that. I think it's a nice buy-in when organizations say, hey, nurses in this area, we're going to support you to become board certified um, in psychiatry. And if your organization can't do it because it's costly and a board certification is not the end all or be all, certainly um, any organization that shows the value of continuing ed and is willing to train nurses in things like DBT, CBT, motivational interviewing, um, SBIRT, these kinds of things um, are, I think are really ways to show your, your your um, employees that you're committed to their continuing education, that there's value in it, and that you believe in evidence-based practice. So I st make a strong argument for continuing ed being um, supported by leadership and financed by leadership. We have another question that came up earlier, yeah. Dr. Bryan, and that is, what type of additional certification can a 50-ish year old LPN with many years of psych nursing experience obtain? You know, that's a really great question. Um, I don't know of any. I, to my knowledge, um, the like board certification from ANCC, the entry level for that is a registered nurse. But um, certification, you can be, I'm almost certain you can get board certified in SBIRT, which is the Substance Brief Referral and Treatment. Um, but more importantly than that, motivational interviewing for sure which is, that serves any area of healthcare, but I think really is relevant because it's based on cognitive behavioral therapy, which is for sure um, useful at all times. So I would say motivational inter interviewing is a great foundation. You can get a certification in that. Most um, continuing ed departments at any campus, um, technical colleges offer it, sometimes as continuing ed. Large healthcare organizations in your community may offer it that other providers can get through. Um, not only certification, but just continuing ed. I mean, LPNs can certainly, and all nurses can certainly be a part of, you know, an update on pharmacology around thought disorders, an update on screening for thought disorders, an update on childhood anxiety and prevention, um, you know, nutrition, mindfulness, I think mindfulness and meditation are often great skills. You know, the other thing we didn't talk about at all here, because it's not the appropriate forum, but is really relevant here, is how do we take care of ourselves? You know, what is the wellness of the providers? And, and there's a lot we can do that also, like when you learn mindfulness, when you learn breathing techniques, when you learn cognitive behavioral therapy skills, those play a part in your own health and wellness as well. You know, we incorporate those breathing techniques into our life. I'm not saying these are easy things. Behavioral change is the worst, right? I'm a nurse. I know better. I know later tonight I should go for a run or a walk and not eat the movie theater box of candy I have sitting on my desk next to me, but I'm still probably going to do it, right? I, I know better. But, I mean, I think anything we can do to reinforce that and teach is really important. Any other questions? We have two minutes left. Yeah, thank you. I, I see another one here. Do you feel that nurses have enough info about mental health issues? in order yes. to advocate for the patient. Yes, of course you have enough to advocate because you're an advocate by nature and by being a nurse. But like I said before, the education that we currently have, um, one, of the, the, one of the big issues being looked at right now in nursing education is that um, it's not required for a clinical rotation. So most of the students that are going to come through UW-Madison will not have a rotation in psychiatry. There's just not enough places. So what I would strongly advocate for is any organization you're a part of, please argue for why you should train students. I don't care what kind of student it is, social work, psychology, pharmacology, medical students, nursing students. It's a ton of time. I understand it impacts productivity models but it's so important. People do not go into psychiatry unless they see it being done and being done well and they fall in love with it. So I can't say that enough. It's not one of those like you see all over TV with these great feelings like, oh, how amazing is that that you work in the emergency department, which is great. I loved it, but it's kind of glamorous. Here there's a little fear, there's stigma, there's, um, you know, these other pieces that we see played out in the media. Show them what it really is. Show them the, the, the amazing 
people you get to serve. Show them their strength. Show them their resiliency. Show them how wonderful it is to be a nurse in psychiatry because you have so much independence. You can use so much innovation. You're on these awesome multidisciplinary teams where often you're the only medical person in the room. Think, you know, it's so much fun. Look at all the places you can serve as a mental health provider. So um, we know we don't do enough in education. We need faculty that come back that have a passion for this work, and we need all of you that are in clinical sites and that are developing research and programs to take on students in the process you do because that's how people fall in love with it. And then the continuing yet. It's an important piece and it's not required for nurses, so we gotta, it's got to come from internally or from our organizations, which is I advocate for that because everybody on this call is a leader in some way around these issues, advocate for it. And people don't know nothing about substance use. So it's really, um, I can't tell you enough about partnering with law enforcement, bringing them in, into your organization, talking about what they're seeing in the communities you're serving. It's, um, we have responsibility as mental health service clinicians to know what's going on in the community. The other thing we see a lot in mental health um, is that we have locum tenants serving, especially as prescribers. What does that mean? There are people from all over the country that call in and do telepsychiatry or in person. They fly in for a few days and see people. They paid a ton of money for doing it. That's ridiculous. They um, hire somebody with that money. I know they can't sometimes, and I know I'm not saying that's ridiculous in that we need providers, so we'll take whatever we can get to provide care. And there's some wonderful locum tenants, but what it is when I am an APR and living in the community I serve is a game changer because then they see, people see me out in the community. I know the public school system. I know the private school system. I know the pharmacies in town. I know what's impacting my kids as they're in school. I know what's impacting my loved ones. I know where I might practice a religion, you know, whatever your personal experience may be. That's a game changer, what you offer. So I think those are really important. we got to think about that. Well, thank I know you so much, Dr. Uh, Brian. This was helpful and useful, and thank you all for the work you do. I hope you love it as much as I do, and um, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. We're, we're at the top of the hour, so I just want to thank you again, Dr. Uh, Brian, and let everyone know that the webinar was recorded. It will be posted on our website in the near future. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. And we're signing off.